Well, hello and good day there. Welcome to the Mr. Beast of ADHD. Russ Barkley here with your Saturday Research Review. Uh, and as always, we're going to start with a couple of dad jokes. These come this time from the website of BoredPanda.com. So here's your first one. This is a little uh, obtuse, so let's see if you can pick this one up. Today, my son asked, can I have a bookmark? And I burst into tears. 11 years old, and he still doesn't know my name is Brian. You really got to think about that one. Come on, think about it. Okay, onward. Here's your next dad joke. How do you make holy water? You boil the hell out of it. <laughs> I actually, I thought that was pretty good. Uh, in any case, I hope you appreciated that. Uh, so first up, we're actually going to talk about um, six studies today very quickly. See if we can get these done in a short period of time because I know you all do not like long videos. You've made that very clear to me. So first up is going to be a meta-analysis, a review in the Journal of European Review for Medical and Pharmacological Sciences. And over there, a colleague over in Saudi Arabia has picked up all of the literature through various online searches such as PubMed and Cochrane and other online databases where he is looking at the prevalence of traumatic dental injuries in people with ADHD. You've heard me talk about this before to some extent, but it's nice to have it done now in a meta-analysis so we can see about the robustness of this association of ADHD with what they call TDIs, traumatic dental injuries. The review found that the prevalence of TDI was between 9.6% and 68% in those with ADHD. That's, uh, that's pretty high there. Uh, in healthy controls, it was around 1% to about 45%. So they did a meta-analysis combining all the findings into a single set of analyses, and they found that people with ADHD were twice as likely as those without ADHD to experience a traumatic dental injury at least one or more times. Now, we've seen this discussed in prior studies out of Sweden and elsewhere, looking at individual databases, much smaller studies that suggested this relationship. We know that ADHD is linked to an increased risk of accidental injuries of all types, including burns, lacerations, head trauma, and so on. And we can now see that it's also linked to an increase in dental trauma. So my thanks for that review out of Saudi Arabia. Next up, we're gonna take a look at what I think is a very important study. And uh, this study uh, is on the association of ADHD in mothers and the likelihood of pregnancy, delivery, and neonatal problems or outcomes when those mothers were pregnant. Uh, so I think a very important study. Uh, this one is done uh, with databases from the United States. And it, let's see, was published over in BMC Pregnancy and Childbirth. I believe that this article was, yep, it was done by a Canadian in conjunction with other colleagues, I believe here in the U.S. as well. No matter, well, here's what we want to know. This is a huge study of more than nine million women, okay? I mean, that's, that's monstrous. And out of that, they found that 10,000 of these women were found to have a diagnosis of ADHD in the database. They then took those women and compared them to women without ADHD, and they were looking at um, individuals who then went on to have a pregnancy and delivery. And what did they find? They found that the mother's ADHD was linked to being younger than 25 years of age at that pregnancy. We've talked about people with ADHD tend to have their children younger than other people do. This seems to suggest that again as well. They found that more of these women were of white ethnicity. They appeared to be more likely to smoke tobacco during pregnancy. We know that people with ADHD use tobacco more often. This suggests that women do so even during pregnancy. They were also more likely to be using illicit drugs during that pregnancy and to suffer from hypertension, 
thyroid disorders, and obesity. We've talked previously about all of those are linked to ADHD to some degree. So no surprise that they would find these women with ADHD experiencing those adverse medical outcomes. They said overall, the women in the ADHD group had a higher rate of hypertensive disorders even during pregnancy. They had much greater likelihood of having a cesarean delivery. They also had chorioamnioitis, which I believe is an infection of the uh, amniotic fluids, uh, but check that out for me. In any case, uh, they also had a higher rate of infection during pregnancy. And they found that regarding the outcome of these neonates from the pregnancy, the patients who had ADHD in the women compared to those without had a higher rate of smaller babies that is small for gestational age, and those babies had a slightly higher rate of congenital anomalies. So now, why is this important? First of all, it's one of the first studies I'm aware of to look at women in a large population database who had ADHD, compare them to a control group of women without ADHD, and look at a variety of difficulties they experienced uh, in their pregnancies. Second, many of these factors that I've just mentioned, such as tobacco use, young age, illicit drug use, hypertension, obesity, have been looked at in other databases and found to be correlated with risk for ADHD in children. And in those papers, the authors have argued that these factors were likely to be causes of the increased risk in ADHD in the offspring. But what this study shows us is exactly what uh, Dr. Steve Ferrone and myself and others have been talking about for a long time, and that is you can't interpret a correlation as a cause. So that just because ADHD might be associated with tobacco during pregnancy, illicit drug use during pregnancy, and so on, doesn't mean that those things are causing the ADHD. And this study shows why because all of the things that others were interpreting as causal, despite being correlational, turn out to be factors related to the mother's ADHD itself. It's the mother's ADHD that is predicting risk in the offspring, not these other incidental things that the women are doing as part of being pregnant, such as smoking and so on. So we need to be really careful here when we go out and do these epidemiologic studies where we find things are linked to the risk of ADHD unless we can control for the genetics of the parents. Because many times, as we saw here, what looks like a risk for causing ADHD in children is just a marker that the parent has ADHD and it's the genetic risk that's being translated. Okay, I've beat that horse to death. Let's move on to our next article, which is on exposure to benzodiazepines and Z-hypnotics during pregnancy and the risk for neurodevelopmental disorders, autism spectrum, and ADHD in the outcome of these individuals. So uh, this is a study that comes out of India, but it is a meta-analysis of the various publications in the world's literature. The authors searched a variety of databases, and they came up with six studies that were eligible for inclusion in their review. And what they found is that mothers who took benzodiazepines or Z-hypnotics during pregnancy did not have an increased risk for autism spectrum disorder in their children. Well, that's really good news because mothers are often concerned about whether they should continue on their antidepressants or anti-anxiety drugs during their pregnancy for fear that it might increase the risk of developmental problems, in this case, neurodevelopmental problems in their offspring. And we can see that certainly the risk for autism spectrum disorder is not increased. Now, in contrast to that, they did find a slightly higher elevation in the risk for ADHD in women who did so. But as the authors interpret it, this was very, very small and only statistically significant because of the very large size of the samples in use here. Over 2 million people were in these various studies. Uh, and uh, 
So you, you got to be careful when you're looking at very small numbers. There was about a 7% increase in risk of ADHD in women, in women who took these drugs during pregnancy. Overall, the authors point out that there are confounding variables here that they couldn't control for. One I just mentioned in that last study, women who may be taking these particular drugs for depression and anxiety may be more likely to also have ADHD as well. And so it's not taking the drug that's increasing the risk for ADHD in their offspring. It's the fact that they have ADHD also. And the authors did not measure that in this study. They didn't look at whether or not the moms had autism spectrum or ADHD. So again, the genetic control that we really need to interpret causality here is missing in this study. Luckily, the authors downplay the significance of the findings and believe that what they really find here is reassurance for pregnant women that they can continue on their medicines and not necessarily predispose their children to a neurodevelopmental disorder. So uh, kudos to those authors for interpreting their results cautiously. Uh, next up is a review out of Barcelona, Spain. Uh, I was just there uh, a little while ago and really enjoyed my time there. I was on a tour, as you know, of Bavaria on a beer tour with uh, 11 friends here in Richmond and the master brewer for Hardywood Brewing. Learned an awful lot about beer, but afterwards my companion and I went to Barcelona for a few days. And over there, they did a review, a systematic review and meta-analysis, again, you know how much I love those, on the association of the Mediterranean diet with mental health problems in children and teens. Uh, and what did they find in their meta-analysis? Well, they identified 13 studies that looked at mental disorders in children and then also looked at the extent to which they were adhering to a Mediterranean diet or some other diet and found that the children and adolescents exposed to a more Mediterranean style diet had lower rates of ADHD, depression, anxiety, than those not adhering to such a diet. Uh, so the authors go on to wonder whether taking a Mediterranean diet might be protective of these mental disorders. Well, hold on a second. Once again, there is this kind of reach for relevance and findings and interpreting correlations that causes. We don't know that. And in fact, an equally, if not more plausible explanation has to do with people with these disorders, particularly ADHD, drift toward very high sugar, high carb, high starch, low protein diets, a kind of Western style fast food, junk food diet. We have ample evidence that that's associated with ADHD and that ADHD leads people to consume that kind of diet. And maybe that's what we're seeing here. The children and adolescents with these various conditions, particularly ADHD, simply may be more likely to drift into a non-Mediterranean nutritional uh, diet rather than the diet itself being causal or protective. So, I mean, that still remains a possibility. Maybe it is protective, but this study doesn't show that. It shows a correlation. So just thought I'd keep reminding you guys out there, though, watch out for these correlations. People want to overinterpret them all the time. Okay, next up is going to be yet another meta-analysis on the value of aerobic exercise and improving executive functions in children with ADHD. This doesn't so much look at ADHD ratings or symptoms. It looks specifically at studies that had taken lab measures of inhibition, uh, of working memory, cognitive flexibility, and so on. And then it looks at the extent to which aerobic or other forms of exercise may have impacted in a positive way these measures of executive functioning. Uh, and overall, they did find that there was significant improvement in measures of EF in children and teens who engaged in exercise. But even more important, they found a number of 
mediating variables, meaning variables that seemed important in those results. First off, aerobic exercise seemed to do better than non-aerobic. Exercise of moderate intensity, exercise that occurred for at least six to 12 weeks and in which the individuals engaged in 60 to 90 minutes of exercise during each exercise episode. And then finally, of course, they found that whether or not the individuals had taken medication also improved their executive functioning. No surprise there. So once again, we can see that evidence is accumulating in the world's literature that aerobic exercise may be of value in helping people to cope with their ADHD symptoms and to lessen the impact ADHD may be having on their executive functioning. Remember, these are tentative or temporary improvements, not permanent improvements, but it does suggest that exercise could be a way of coping with and compensating for one's ADHD difficulties. So uh, that was an article that came to us out of China, but it is a review of the world's literature. Lastly, we're going to wrap it up with sort of a semi-humorous research paper that appeared over in the journal Plus One and was also republished over on this university's website. It was done over in Scotland, and it's a paper on the relationship of ADHD to missing appointments with your general practitioner. And they found that in looking at people who had missed appointments, people with ADHD were 60% more likely to miss an appointment with their general practitioner if they were under the age of 18, and they were nearly twice as likely to miss appointments with their physicians if they were over the age of 18. Uh, so about 38% of them, in fact, had missed appointments. So this is not new, by the way. Clinicians working in the field of ADHD know that if you're going to operate a clinic for ADHD, as I did for many decades, that you have to plan for the fact that many of your patients are not going to show at the appointed time for their appointment uh, and take steps to try to pre prevent or at least reduce the odds of that happening, because none of us like to be sitting around with missed appointments in our clinical practice. So, uh, so watch it, you guys out there. If you're gonna book appointments with your general practitioner, please show up. Okay, that's our research review for this week. I uh, hope you found it informative. As always, all the other research is over in the description that goes with the video. And keep in mind, I don't review dissertations, master's theses, editorials, or animal research here. I'm only looking at peer-reviewed articles that were published in journals. So, okay, and hope you enjoyed the, the dad jokes as well. Uh, if you're not a subscriber, please subscribe. If you are, thank you. We're nearing 100,000 subscribers on this channel, and I just had my one-year anniversary of this channel this week. So thanks for making it such a successful channel with over 2.2 million views. You guys out there are great. All right, let's wrap this up, and let's go and enjoy the summertime here in Richmond, hence the t-shirt, Salt Life on the t-shirt as well. Uh, and as always, I wish you guys to live well and be